Hi, I'm Joni Watson. Today, I'd like to share about primary and secondary prevention of lung cancer, the most prevalent and one of the most deadly cancers, both within the U.S. and around the world. We'll cover both primary prevention, meaning what we all typically think of in regards to prevention, such as diet, exercise, tobacco cessation, and we'll also cover secondary prevention, meaning lung cancer screening. Tertiary prevention, which includes treatment and survivorship, is absolutely important to improving the health of patients. And all nurses, no matter their specialties or roles, can impact lung cancer. But for the purposes of this learning activity, we'll focus on primary and secondary lung cancer prevention. Let's take a good look at the overall picture of lung cancer not only in the U.S., but also globally. According to the American Cancer Society, over 1.6 million people are expected to be diagnosed with cancer in this year alone in the United States. Of those cases, over 228,040 people will have lung cancer, accounting for 14% of all cancer diagnoses. Lung cancer accounts for more deaths than any other cancer in both men and women, and approximately 160,000 deaths will result from lung cancer alone in 2013. You can see from the graphs provided by the American Cancer Society that lung cancer impacts more men than women. This is true for both incidents as well as deaths. While we'll discuss more about tobacco cessation later, you can see that the deaths also correlate to the times around tobacco use. For example, women gravitated to tobacco after men, and the death curves allude to that. It was actually the American Cancer Society who definitively pointed to the link between tobacco use and lung cancer, and subsequently death via what's known as the Hammond Horn Study in the 1950s, which became the precursor for the current society's cancer prevention studies. And still to this day, lung cancer remains the most preventable cause of death in our society. The five-year survival rate for all lung cancers is a grim 16%, which is far lower than many cancer survival rates, and well below the overall 66% five-year survival rate of all cancers combined. Lung cancer actually kills more people than the three most common cancers that follow it combined. Yet, it is highly preventable. Globally, lung cancer has even larger disparities. It remains the largest cancer killer as 1.37 million people die each year of lung cancer around the world. This is largely due to tobacco use globally, which is prevalent in developing countries. So let's discuss some of the anatomy and pathophysiology of lung cancer. The National Cancer Institute describes the lungs as a pair of cone-shaped breathing organs in the chest. The lungs bring oxygen into the body as you breathe in. They release carbon dioxide, a waste product of the body's cells as you breathe out. Each lung has sections called lobes. The left lung has two lobes. The right lung is slightly larger and it has three lobes. Two tubes called bronchi lead from the trachea or windpipe to the right and left lungs. The bronchi are sometimes also involved in lung cancer. Tiny air sacs called alveoli and small tubes called bronchioles make up the inside of the lungs. About 84% of all lung cancers are described as non-small cell. Approximately 15% of lung cancers are small cell and a much smaller amount of lung cancers, 1% actually, are defined as carcinoid tumors. In comparison, the small cell lung cancers are more aggressive and typically they spread more rapidly. Non-small cell cancers are most commonly comprised of one of three different cell types which may expand the name of the non-small cell cancer. For example, squamous cell carcinomas are cancers that begin in the squamous cells which are thin flat cells that look like fish scales. This is also called epidermoid carcinoma. Large cell carcinoma is cancer that may begin in several types of large cells. 
And lastly, adenocarcinoma is cancer that begins in the cells that line the alveoli and make substances such as mucus. Small cell cancers include two types. Small cell carcinoma, which is often called oat cell cancer due to the way it looks under the microscope, and combined small cell carcinoma. Signs and symptoms of lung cancer, which typically appear late in the tumor growth process, include coughing, bloody sputum, pain in the chest or swallowing, vocal changes, fatigue, and breathing changes such as shortness of breath, wheezing, and pneumonia, as well as unexplained weight loss. Non-small cell lung cancer, the most common type of lung cancer, utilizes the TNM staging system, or tumor node metastasis model. This is a simplified version of non-small cell lung cancer staging. In stage one, the cancer is located only in the lungs and has not spread to any lymph nodes. Stage two, the cancer is in the lung and the nearby lymph nodes. While in stage three, cancer is found in the lungs and in the lymph nodes in the middle of the chest. This also is described as locally advanced disease. In stage four, this is the most advanced stage of lung cancer, and it also is described as advanced disease. This is when the cancer is spread to both lungs, to fluid in the area around the lungs, or to another part of the body, such as the liver or the organs. Small cell lung cancer, which accounts for 15% of all lung cancers, may also utilize a TNM staging, or it may simply be referred to as limited stage or extensive stage. Limited stage cancer is found on only one side of the chest, involving just one part of the lung and nearby lymph nodes. On the other hand, extensive stage indicates the cancer has spread to other regions of the chest or other parts of the body. There are actually numerous risk factors for lung cancer. As mentioned earlier, men have a slightly higher lung cancer incidence and death rate than females. And the majority of those living with lung cancer are age 60 or older. In regards to race, black men have higher incidence and mortality rates than their white male counterparts. However, the incidence and mortality rates among black and white women are relatively similar. Tobacco exposure remains the number one risk factor for lung cancer as it's the cause of 87% of all lung cancer deaths. About 3,400 of these deaths are the result of secondhand exposure to tobacco smoke. Those exposed to secondhand smoke have a 30% increased risk of lung cancer. So one person or patient smoking is not only impacting one life, but it may be impacting numerous lives and putting many others at risk for lung cancer for other cancers, or even for other chronic diseases. According to the American Lung Association, it has been estimated that active smoking is responsible for close to 90% of lung cancer cases. Radon causes 10%. Occupational exposures to carcinogens account for approximately 9 to 15%. And outdoor air pollution, 1 to 2%. Because of the interactions between exposures, the combined attributable risk for lung cancer can actually exceed 100%. Exposure to radon is estimated to be the second leading cause of lung cancer, accounting for an estimated 15,000 to 22,000 lung cancer deaths each year. Radon is a tasteless, colorless, and odorless gas that is produced by decaying uranium and it occurs naturally in soil and rock. The majority of these deaths occur among smokers since there is a greater risk for lung cancer when smokers also are exposed to radon. Lung cancer can also be caused by occupational exposures, including asbestos, uranium, and coal, an important fuel in the manufacture of iron in smelters, blast furnaces, and foundries. The combination of asbestos exposure and smoking greatly increases the risk of developing lung cancer. Non-smoking asbestos workers are five times more likely to develop lung cancer than non-smokers not exposed to asbestos. 
If they also smoke, the risk factor jumps to 50 or higher. Environmental exposures also can increase the risk of lung cancer death. Let's talk about the specific lung cancer prevention and screening strategies. The most well-known and evidence-based strategy to prevent lung cancer is to avoid tobacco or stop using tobacco. This one prevention strategy has a broader impact than just lung cancer though. The American Cancer Society estimates that one in five preventable deaths is the result of tobacco use. That's 443,000 deaths each year. So as nurses, using evidence-based strategies to assess tobacco status of our patients and encouraging them to stop using tobacco is a highly effective prevention strategy and educational opportunity. The five A's is one such evidence-based program. The five A's include ask, advise, assess, assist, and arrange. With this model, first you ask each patient about his or her tobacco use status at every visit and record the patient's response. Then advise clear, non-judgmental, and personalized suggestions for quitting. Tell patients that you understand quitting is difficult and challenging, but it can also be the most important thing they do for their own health and for their family's health. Next, assess each patient's readiness and interest in quitting. The patient's response to your questions about his or her willingness and readiness to quit will affect the next step in the process. If he or she is willing to quit, you'll offer resources and assistance, which is the next step. If not, you'll help the patient determine the barriers to cessation and start again. As mentioned, the next step includes assist each patient with a specific cessation plan. This will include materials, resources, pharmaceuticals, or referrals. Patients should be encouraged to pick a quit date and given support and feedback. Lastly, you'll arrange follow-up visits. If patients relapse, let them know you and your staff members will be there to help them dust off and start over again. Help them keep in mind that quitting takes practice and often is not achieved after the first attempt. The 5A should be done at each and every visit for every patient. It doesn't have to be a lengthy discussion each visit. It's actually the persistence and consistence that matters. The quit line is an excellent practical resource for patients, and more information about that is at the end of this educational activity. Routine screening for lung cancer has been a long debated issue. The National Lung Screening Trial of 2010 indicated that routine lung cancer screening for all populations can actually cause more harm than benefit. However, there is a specific population of people who could greatly benefit from routine lung cancer screening via low-dose CT, those with moderate to high risk of lung cancer. People eligible for routine lung cancer screening include those who are asymptomatic. Because if someone is symptomatic, they actually need diagnostic workup rather than screening. It also includes people who have had significant secondhand smoke exposure, those who have had previous history of other malignancies, which would increase their risk of lung cancer due to the previous cancer's treatment modality, for example, radiation, or those with a previous head and neck cancer due to smoking, and those who have had a 30 or more pack year smoking history. As an aside, a pack year is defined as the number of packs smoked each day multiplied by the number of years the person smoked that amount. You can also think about it as the number of cigarettes smoked per day multiplied by the number of years smoked and then divided by 20 since there are 20 cigarettes in one pack. This allows us to get a smoking history over time. For example, a smoker who smoked 20 cigarettes per day for two years would have a two-pack year history because there are 20 cigarettes in one pack. For another example, one smoker who smoked two packs per day for 10 years 
would have a 20-pack year history. Patients with a 30-pack history or above are considered high risk and are appropriate for low-dose helical CT lung screening annually. Nurses are key to improving health and wellness for all, including lung cancer survivors and their families. Nurses can affect the public's awareness and willingness to use screening measures that can prevent lung cancers and detecting lung cancers earlier, increasing the opportunity for cure and survival. Thank you.